During this episode, we are joined by Dr. Phil Wagner, CEO and founder of Sparta Science, a movement health intelligence company dedicated to helping the world move better. While together, Dr. Wagner shares his journey in the health technology industry, the early beginnings of Sparta Science, and how his company is combining modern data science, clinical expertise, and epidemiological principles to fuel organization-wide movement health decisions. He also addresses common misconceptions about movement health intelligence and highlights the benefits of Sparta Science's technology for healthcare providers and patients. Additionally, Dr. Wagner emphasizes the importance of resilience, conviction, and flexibility in pursuing innovation in the healthcare industry. Join us for this exciting conversation as Dr. Wagner discusses how the Sparta Science team optimizes movement health intelligence. Let's go. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. Hi, Dr. Wagner. A big welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. Well, as a national thought leader in the emerging movement health technology industry and your passion to helping the world move better, I'm really looking forward to this important and exciting conversation today. But before we dive in, a bit of housekeeping. While listening to any of our episodes, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast so you will automatically receive episode updates in your podcast player. Simply search Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli and Apple Podcasts Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, please visit the bottom of the episode notes to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter in order to further the conversations occurring on this podcast. All right, Phil, it's almost time for our community to learn how you and the Sparta Science team empower organizations to optimize movement health outcomes. But first, what's that one piece of advice that you would give to others who are passionate about reimagining the health of our world? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is resilience. Anytime you're trying to change, and a lot of times resilience can be a cliched word, but a lot of times you're trying to change something, particularly in something as big and impactful as healthcare, it's not going to be a linear and easy path, right? And it's got to be one that is filled with conviction in order to overcome the variety of challenges that you're going to encounter along the way. I mean, you're spot on, Phil. It is one of the hardest industries to innovate within, but the biggest potential opportunity for incredible outcomes. I mean, Phil, you know, as well as I do, talk about resiliency. We're going to dive into it today during our time together. You guys have been at it now for over seven plus years at Sparta Science. Talk about resilience. That's incredible. We're going to get there again when we dive in a little bit deeper on the other side of the commercial break. But first, Phil, back to it. You're spot on. You have to have resilience in healthcare is very complex. There's a lot of players in this space. It's a multi-sided marketplace, if you will, not just buy-sided, but multi-sided. You have payers, providers, patients. It's a very complex industry. Phil, is this something that you also, throughout the entire organization, that you kind of lead with as the CEO, as a founder, that all your team members must have that resilience as you move forward and continue to innovate within Sparta Science? Yeah, I think you have to when you're pursuing innovation. And our journey began in the DOD, which isn't any less harder to move than healthcare, right? So, you know, I think when you're going after large scale changes, everybody top to bottom has to be both convicted yet flexible, right? Because you're going to encounter things along the way that you didn't expect that are both positive and negative and how you respond and redirect is just a key characteristic, not only at the organizational level, but from each individual. Absolutely. But we're going to unpack all of that more, Phil, how Sparta Science got going, where you guys are today, and all the wonderful things happening within your camp. We're going to get after it about all of that and more after we get back from thinking our community champion sponsor. Located in Denver, Colorado's nationally ranked River North District, Catalyst is a healthcare innovation campus that brings together stakeholders from across the industry to accelerate innovation and drive real, lasting change our nation desperately needs. From established organizations to startups, from accelerators to advocacy organizations, and from medical schools to global companies, everyone at Catalyst works side by side to create, develop, refine, and bring to market cutting edge innovations that will fundamentally transform healthcare as we know it. 
with industry leaders like Medical Group Management Association, Olive, Medical Solutions, UC Health, Cirrus MD, and many others calling Catalyst home, along with innovative pioneers visiting from across the nation. Catalyst continually fosters their foundational belief that collaboration and partnerships will move the healthcare industry forward. To virtually tour Catalyst and claim your space on campus or host an upcoming event, visit CatalystHealthTech.com or visit the top of the episode notes and click on their link. All right, we are back with Dr. Phil Wagner, CEO of Sparta Science. Phil, what a great start to the episode here. An important conversation, an important lesson, especially in healthcare and innovation. Resiliency is key. This is a very difficult place to innovate. But again, as we said on the front end, what an amazing place to have an opportunity to innovate. And the outcomes that we can bring to healthcare can be enormous. And we're going to go there. We're going to talk about what you guys are doing within Sparta Science, a little bit of history as well. You mentioned on the front end, started kind of within DOD. That's a complex beast in and of itself. Talk about those early beginnings, those aha moments, how it came to be. What's going on today within the Sparta Science camp and how everything is going in the marketplace? We're going to take the crystal ball off the shelf for a moment, see what's going on future state. What are you seeing on the horizon that we need to be mindful of? And of course, how we can help you. But first, Phil, take us back. What are those aha moments seven plus years now with Sparta Science being formed and out there in the marketplace? How did this all come to be in the first place? Yeah, I think for me, it began as an athlete and in college having several injuries and realizing that despite the attempts to rehab and prevent any sort of injuries that were occurring, you know, they continue to happen. And I really didn't know why. And it wasn't for lack of effort. And so it began this quest of like, well, how can we quantify how someone's moving and direct them better from a preventative or a rehab standpoint. And that's where Sparta was born, the concept of let's work on measuring objectively and quickly how an individual moves. And from that signal, what we call a movement signature, we can help the individual and the organizations guide that person to avoid or at least limit the risk of injury. And that kind of began in sports in the military. But that occurrence of injuries, whether it's even less or so pain or fear, really exists. And everybody's got their own story around some sort of movement related injury. No, absolutely. I deal with myself. I, you know, college athlete as well. I have uh, chronic lower back pain from my college football day. So trust me, I know all about it, Phil. Absolutely. Talk about a bit you mentioned on the front end about the DOD. What was that about? How did that come to be? That's very mystifying to a lot of us. Unpack that a bit about the DOD. Yeah. So when we started working with sports organizations, there's some shared carryover between military and their desire to perform higher and prevent injuries. So we started working in the DOD. And one of the surprising things that we found was how layered these organizations are, you know, from leadership all the way down to the practitioner, to the warfighter, the soldier themselves, and how each one of those stakeholders is truly unique in what they're trying to find value out of as it relates to movement health. And I think we continue to see within the military and in healthcare how widespread movement health is and that impacts in a way almost every condition, whether that's mental health or things more related to metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes. There's really a play for movement in all those different conditions. And the DOD helped kind of realize that, but also realize the complexity of these organizations and taking care of people isn't this one to one situation. There's executive leadership, there's legal compliance, there's the practitioners all the way down. And how do you actually message and create value for those different groups is nuanced, but very different. And so in regards to your tagline, if you will, we're going to get into now the company current state and what that looks like, and what you guys are working on. But you message within the tagline of the organization, we optimize how organizations assess, understand, and improve health and well-being. Now, of course, as I said earlier as well, Phil, you're not in just like, you know, month six or year one. You guys have been doing it for some time. Before we talk about current state and how things are going with Sparta Science, rewind the clock again, those early founding days where people are like, what are you talking about, Phil? What does this mean? I have deer in headlights looking back at what your vision is for Sparta Science. What was it like those early days? Yeah, I think the hardest part is initially we actually didn't take venture funding and did bootstrapping, which is very rare right, in digital health. And we didn't know much personally. I didn't have any experience in that space. So bootstrapping into large enterprise organizations was brutal. People talk about debt being financial, but there's other forms of debt, you know, that get developed 
people debt. We didn't have roles built out. People were wearing eight hats. We had tech debt, right? Things were built on this scaffolding made of paper, if you will. So we created all these debt in different areas because we initially bootstrapped. And that was really tough on the organization. On the good side is it forces you to be very economical about the decisions you make and the areas you focus on. You know, but a lot of these setbacks that occurred were really because there's not a buffer when you don't have this large amount of funding behind you. Going into certain markets, not having contracting or compliance in place. And so it was a real kind of eye-opener for us to go after enterprise health or things like the DOD. You really have to raise funding enough to build out these key roles because these enterprise relationships don't happen overnight. You know, they take a long time to develop not only to gain adoption, but then also to show the value of whatever data or information you're using. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's getting a little bit of that chicken the egg conundrum. It is incredibly tough. I couldn't agree more with you, Phil. So you got through those early days, you know, as well as I do, the heavy majority of startups don't even make it past year three. Here you are again over year seven now. So let's talk about current state, Phil. I always love to do this and hear what it is today. What is Sparta Science today? Yeah, so today... What we've been able to accomplish is set up this movement intelligence platform that leverages things like, for example, we do a balance assessment. And so individuals will do a balance. And from that test, a minute or so, it'll collect about a million data points. And so we've got machine learning in the background that's taken all those data points along with other information, age, gender, birth, occupation, history, and then it creates this profile and allows the individual to have a risk associated with that in whatever is interesting to the organization. Could be fall risk, could be ACL risk for a sports medicine. And so all this happens in real time. And so that's really the value right now currently. And our pace car, if you will, is weighing in, right? So if you get on the scale and weigh in, why not be able to do that with what we use a device called a force plate and gather a million other data points at the same time, right? So that's the pace car because In healthcare, right, so much of the challenge is how do you fit into the workflow without changing it? That was the real focus currently in the past year and a half is making sure that that workflow is invisible or seamless into what's currently going on into the health systems. In regards to what is currently going on, can you also talk about what are some of the common misconceptions about musculoskeletal injuries that you guys and the team at Sparta Science are trying to address as well with technology? There's all sorts of ones, and most are around assumptions, right? And you know, big assumption is, oh, if you're a certain age, you're at fall risk. If you're above 70, you're at fall risk. And I was joking with a hospital executive about a month ago that when you go to the hospital, you put on yellow socks if you're at fall risk, right? And he was walking the halls and there was an individual who was wearing yellow socks in the hospital. And he asked him, hey, you're at fall risk. You're not supposed to be up and about on your own because you're at risk. So the person ran back in their yellow socks, ran back into the room and got back into their hospital bed. The irony, right, of like, we're just using very simple, archaic metrics to assign movement health, and in this case, risk of falling. It's unbelievable that that is what we're still doing current state or pair of socks, right? And so with the technology, you're bringing that data-driven approach to say that health executive or other administrators or providers and clinicians to truly assess if Mike is a fall risk or not. Would that be true? Yeah, because there can be individuals that are much younger that are at fall risk, 60 years old, and there could be 80-year-olds going on 50, right? And so what we really want to know is how is that individual's movement status and what should be emphasized and avoided based on that? You know, in a lot of ways, we're finding that out in nutrition. Different individuals can eat the same thing and respond very differently. When technologies like continuous blood glucose monitoring are now showing that, And so that's a good goal that we have right now and focused on recognizing that individuals' movement health responds differently to different things. And how do we quantify that and improve it? And let's talk about that, quantifying and improving it. And of course, you mentioned going into the enterprise and all of that. So with that, Phil, you teed me up for a question I've been wanting to ask for this episode. And it's around how can healthcare organizations and practitioners benefit from incorporating movement health intelligence platforms like yours? Yeah, well, I think the biggest issue we all deal with in healthcare is compliance. And how do you actually get buy-in from the patient, right? Everybody's struggling. It's a human problem, right? And so the biggest way that practitioners, health systems are finding value right now is 
it provides a picture for the patient of here's where you're at. And when it comes to a movement standpoint, that just doesn't exist. And so if you're doing a physical therapy program with a patient and they stop coming after visit three, four, a lot of times it's because why am I going in? I don't know if I'm getting better, even though they are, you know, and it's because they're searching, they want, they're thirsty for that feedback, right? And the therapist is giving good feedback, but we're in this digital age now where the patient expects something quantifiable. So that's the biggest impact is compliance and allows practitioners and organizations to maintain patients for longer, which allows them to treat them for better outcomes. I think the other factor is, you know, we are in a world where provider economics matter. And so the device we use and the assessments we do are used in billing codes, right? And that helps, you know, a lot of organizations actually be reimbursed for efforts that they're doing or already doing, it just allows them to do it more at scale. And ultimately, I think over time, they're building their own database of here's how certain patients with these conditions of these ages respond to these interventions, right? So we're truly creating this response curve when it comes to exercise. You know, I always love to hear, you know, success stories. You know, we can always talk about the vision of the company and why we believe as founders that it's so good and it's the best thing since sliced bread. But can you share any success stories or positive outcomes from your end users that are using the technology? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the most positive things we found is a massive uptick in patients completing more than six out of their 12 visits, you know, in physical therapy. Huge, you know, 5X uptick. And that's so impactful, both from a outcomes of the patient becoming healthier, but also from an economic standpoint, they're able to actually maintain that patient for a longer period of time. You know, I think it took us a while. One of the learnings I had as an entrepreneur is it's far beyond patient health. That is the most important thing. But we also can't overlook that there's an economic component to all of this as well, that for these clinics, hospitals, health systems to continue to grow. They have to be involved in providing, you know, areas where they can grow economically based on, you know, whether it's billing codes or patient recruitment, right? And all these aspects of how do you actually attract more patients and retain those patients too, right? Ultimately, if both of those are happening, you're able to help more people. Well, let's talk about, you know, continuing to help people and, you know, future state things are happening and changing very fast in the industry. We're eventually one day going to get there where we're really having to truly go all in on value-based care, not quite there yet, where everybody's going to have that skin in the game, patient included. You talked about that a little bit earlier. So, you know, with that, Phil, let's take that crystal ball off the shelf. Let's talk a little future state. Where is the industry going? This is a big, big space. I mean, you know, we talk about older adults in our country. I think it's 10,000 baby boomers are retiring a day right now. Huge space, right? When you start thinking about that, start thinking about potentially the mechanics of value-based care kind of starting to turn. And then, of course, the advent of digital technology and innovation really starting to make a really big play inside of healthcare. So taking that crystal ball off the shelf, where do you see things heading on the macro? And where is Sparta Science going to be in that equation in the next two to three, three to five years? Yeah, I think the biggest shift that's happening at this point, people are aware of all the ways to collect data and how to instrument people, right? Whether it's a wearable or sorts of devices, and that's happening more and more. So as a result, now the question is, so what? So what are we going to do with all this information? How do we use it? What's valuable? What's not for different conditions? And so the future state is, you know, we've positioning as this biomarker data platform, right? And so as a result, we're able to be pulling in wearable data, exercise data, some of the scan data I mentioned from a force plate, a balance test, and start linking these things up in a way much like pharmaceuticals, right? Where you're getting this dose response. And how much exercise you need, is it really 10,000 steps? Or is it more 8,000? Or is it 12,000, right? So how do we start developing thresholds based on real data that's catered to each individual? And that biomarker data platform really is positioned in a way to start building these models and providing those insights. There's a lot we can do today, right now, what you just described. I think also a lot of it goes back to mindset within healthcare. How do I say this diplomatically? Uh, healthcare is very risk adverse, uh, very slow to change. You know, status quo loves to reign at times. 
But, you know, to your point, there's a lot of that already in the marketplace. There is true opportunity to bring that all together in a unified experience, just like you mentioned, Phil. But what then also does that do in regards to what you just described? Yes, that's for the patient. Hey, maybe Mike needs 12,000 steps, not 10. Maybe Phil needs nine and not 10. That's all exciting and good. But then also, what does that mean as healthcare continues to change? Again, value-based care environment. You start looking for a more of a cash play environment, right? Where people are paying maybe concierge services. What does that look like in this ever-changing way of how we pay for healthcare as well? Yeah, so we start talking about value-based care, right? We're really talking about preventative medicine. That's the biggest inflection point and impact. It'd be hard to find a more preventative medicine than movement. And so when you think about that as a fact, movement being, hey, this is the preventative medicine, then the next question is, which movement? How much? Because what we really want to do, again, following pharmaceuticals, how we find that XR pill for movement? the extended release, right? Because that starts addressing compliance, right? Most people don't move or exercise because it's too daunting. You know, I don't want to walk for an hour. I don't want to go to the gym for an hour. And so let's be smarter about it. If you just did this for 10 minutes, that's all you need, right? And so that's really how pharmaceuticals improve their compliance. And movement and exercise has the same opportunity if there's data collected in a standardized way and really mind to provide those insights back to the individual. Absolutely brilliant how you frame that up. I love it. And it's true. And we can get there. We can do that and imagine the byproduct of what that can mean for society writ large. Incredibly powerful, Phil. Thank you for that. We're going to throw the crystal ball back on the shelf for now. We'll bring a little future or current state. Talk about you know, where we can also be helping you, where the community can plug in. We have an amazing community plugged into the podcast. What's one problem, need, or question that's happening in your Sparta Science Camp today that the community can be helping you with? Yeah, I think we hit on it earlier, right? Healthcare is not the fastest moving (laughs) ecosystem, right? And there is a lot of risk averse, you know, organizations within healthcare, rightfully so, right? There's the human health condition is fragile. And so the more that we can create awareness and adoption from healthcare users, the more that de-risks it for other people to start adopting the technology. And so really understanding, I think, two things, you know, helping spread the word, how important movement is. And then the other is how organizations should really be adopting platforms like this to track and improve their patients' movement health. And for our community that wants to talk about that, kind of discuss these topics that you just outlined, how do they get a hold of you, social media handles, websites, or otherwise, how do they track you down, Phil? Yeah, so our Twitter handle is Sparta Science, and the website is Sparta Science. LinkedIn is, you know, again, pretty creative, Sparta Science. You know, so I think any of those channels, and I have a LinkedIn channel as well, Phil Wagner, and any of those channels, we're constantly kind of posting information about this topic of movement health, but also some of the case studies of how individuals and organizations are finding value from kind of looking at it from that perspective. Easy enough. And for our listening community, just simply scroll down on your favorite podcast player and connect with Phil and the team. They will be in the episode notes for you to take advantage to get a hold of Sparta Science and the team. Again, just scroll down in your notes of your favorite podcast player, or you can head over to our free global online community at passionatepioneers.com. There will be a post for this episode to get a hold of Phil and the team. You can also leave comments and feedbacks in that post as well. Again, over at uh, passionatepioneers.com. Phil, we're going to start winding it down, but we're not going to let you go quite yet. We have a fill in the blank for you. I'm a passionate pioneer because? I don't want to be cliched, but, you know, I'm a passionate pioneer because this is what I've been called to do. At the most basic primal level, I believe that, and it sounds totally cliche, but I believe that every experience and education and job I've ever had has prepared me for this endeavor. Well, the uh, proof's in the pudding, Phil. You wouldn't be this far into it for this many years if you weren't that incredibly dedicated to it. So to me, not cliche whatsoever. It is very, very evident. Phil, thank you so much for taking a pit stop today. I know how busy you and the team are. I appreciate you taking time to be with our community on this podcast today. Keep up the great work over at Sparta Science. But for now, thanks again for being with us today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. 
We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.